This year, 2020, has been a challenging year for many of us. Personally, for me, I've been through not one, but two life-changing events. The first one is the global COVID-19 pandemic that I share with many of you in terms of worrying about health, the potential financial recession, or just not being able to meet family and friends in person. The second one is childbirth, which is a very happy event. But uh, because I was a first-time mother, I had to learn so many new things which were totally outside my domain knowledge and also recover from health. Both of these events have permanently changed the way I work. I had to take a long break of six months to finally restart my hardware and software projects and take videos weekly to share them on YouTube. So I can summarize in three parts the difficulty in restarting some old forgotten projects after a long period of time, six months that is. And the three parts are basically number one, capturing all sorts of information, stuff and data about those projects. Number two is documentations about these projects. And number three, what are the next steps about these projects? What can we do to continue these projects? So in today's video, I want to share some best practices that I learned from others, especially the online open source hardware and software community that I learned. And I incorporate some of these practices in helping me restart these unfinished projects. The first step is simply capture. And this is basically capturing all things like physical, digital information data. And I found this term in the Getting Things Done framework where the author David Allen describes the term as collecting everything, everything really physical or digital. Now, for the purpose of physical capture, I like to use project boxes. So one of the box is called current box, which is basically where I dump everything and anything that I'm currently working on. I'm testing out the Arduino Nano 33 BLE Sense board now, or it could be this LoRa module with some breadboard and wires, which are part of a currently ongoing project. Now, after I get past the initial prototyping phase when I kind of manufacture the PCB and I scale it down, I usually use these cardboard boxes that comes with the manufactured PCB and I put each of the project in each of these boxes. Here I must mention how important it is to have a project name and use it consistently everywhere. Now each box will have various components of the project such as batteries, soldered PCB or mechanical housing, etc. Well, another similar idea that I saw is using trays and I guess it works great as well if you have numerous projects at hand. So after a long gap of six months, what I did personally is to come back and just take a look at all the stuff that's inside. Did it really help me get started immediately? Not really, but at least I started remembering the things I did before. The next part of having a capture system is to keep a logbook like this. Now, for me, I have a physical logbook and I love digital logbooks as well uh, because of the tablets that are available and also the beautiful apps that are available. For example, Notability for iPad or other tablets. The other app that I know is called GoodNotes and these are amazing, beautiful apps for hand drawing stuff with a pen. But I don't have an iPad. I hope maybe one day I will. Uh, so I have just started using this logbook. Now I started using this logbook barely last year. So my system for this logbook is really, really, really simple. Each page has one date with a summary of what I did that day, boxed up text to denote the project name or the experiment I did. Question marks are my doubts. Some related drawings, highlighted portions are my findings or conclusions. And arrow symbols are my next action to do tasks. So what I did simply is to look at the last few pages of this logbook when I came back to once again, kind of have a refresher of what I was working on just before I went off. After taking a look at all the physical ways of capturing everything about the project, there is the digital way of capturing things. And for this, I like to use the Git version control. Now I put, once again, 
everything to do digital uh, software, of course, uh, and files, everything to do with that project in one single folder, check it into a Git repository and push it remotely to either say GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab, your choice, doesn't matter the tool, but the idea is to have everything in one Git repository for one project. Here is an example of Orange Crab by Greg Deville. He has two folders called Enclosure, which has the mechanical files and Hardware, which has the KiCad files for schematics and layout. Another example is uh, the Monster Moto Shield by SparkFun. The firmware file includes the Arduino IONO file and the hardware folder similarly includes the Eagle file, the board file and the schematic file. The next advantage of using the Git version control as a digital capture system is that you also have something like a logbook, which is basically the commit history. Now for commit messages, I like to use the conventional commits format so that there is some kind of consistency when reading and understanding the commit history. For example, this is the Angular JS commit history using the conventional commits format. The next crucial step of documentation is having a readme file inside that folder so that that is the first thing that we access when we open up the folder. Thankfully, there are plenty of examples on how to write a good readme document along with plenty of examples from the open source community. Now, the single biggest section I feel any readme should have is a getting started section. Now, typically, we would love to have the getting started section to say a minimum of three steps or even lesser, but three steps is a good guideline. Very simple three steps guideline on how to get a hello world uh, feature or a project started. An open source hardware project example on getting started section is once again, Orange Crab by Greg Deville. Sometimes I can totally understand that in the world of hardware, things take time. Here it says that it does take about 30 minutes. But like we said, sometimes it can take a lot more than three steps. It can be very complicated installing a lot of things, dependencies, trying to run hour long processes to get even the simplest Hello World feature working. In this case, I love to abstract away the multiple steps and put them in a default make command as part of the make file. Such an example is the Tomu getting started section. Here it makes use of the command make to run the bare minimal example. To be honest, using the make files default command make can hide a lot of complexities and multiple steps for the first time user and also help run the hello world example as easily as possible. So now that we have kind of looked at the physical stuff about the project, we have also looked at the readme uh, file for the project, looked at the commit history, we kind of have an idea of what the project is about, what it constitutes. I think the next step is really to get the hardware and software set up and up and running so that it kind of gives us the confidence to dive deeper into the nitty gritty details. For this, I love to break up the project into smaller chunks and get the chunks running first. I once came across the concept of a minimal reproducible code in one of the guidelines in Stack Overflow. Ever since then, I have used this idea to either reproduce a bug, write a hello world example, or even write a failing test. I have a list of hello world examples containing such reprex code because they are also hardware related examples. So along with the firmware code, I like to include three things to help me get that working setup faster. Number one, the schematics. Number two, the photo of the actual setup. And number three, the serial monitor or the print statement results. The other cool thing about documents is that we can actually publish the document and it can be tightly integrated with the Git vision control because when we have the documents as part of the same folder, we can actually publish the information as an HTML page on the web. I like to use GitHub static pages and include my documentation and code in the same repository. We can also embed the exact code as part 
of the HTML page with partials and its associated syntax highlighting, for example, in HTML, shell, or the C programming language. So hopefully by now, after having the capture system to help us remember what we were working on and then the documents to help us also get started some Hello World features or parts of the project, the next inevitable action to do is what to do next. For this step, I like to use the to-do comments in the code. It is often available as a text editor plugin that will automatically search throughout the entire code base for keywords such as to do, notes, fix me, etc. For example, to do show is the Atom text editor plugin and to do highlight is very similar and it is the VS code plugin. So I basically use these code words throughout uh, the entire Git repository and that kind of helps me remember what to do next and some context about the project. Now, sometimes we really do not know what new feature to work on because, you know, the project has been so long, we really kind of lost the context about it. In this case, I love to start working by fixing a tiny bug. A common concept in the world of test-driven development is red-green refactor, which means we write just enough to make a failing test, write just enough to make the test pass, and write just enough code to refactor it. So sometimes in a project when we do have a complete test suit, what we can do is at the end of the day, just write one failing test. So when we come back to it a week later or even months later, all we need to do is run the entire test suit and work on that single test that is failing. The other simple test is to simply raise a bug or an issue and look at all the stuff that we can start to fix. This could be our GitHub issues or internal Jira bug list. So those were some of the things that I did to help me get back to some of my unfinished projects. Now, I definitely think that I'm not the only one on the internet that has some difficulties getting back to old forgotten projects. And here are a couple of links that I found either in Stack Overflow or on Reddit that also discussed similar things. Even with all these steps, I will admit that not all my projects had all of these steps. And uh, even after implementing all of these steps, I cannot guarantee that I was able to get up and going immediately. But that is fine because the reality is this, the projects can be complex. The projects can have many, many moving parts and it is fine. So let's not beat up ourselves when we cannot get back to old forgotten projects immediately. But hopefully with some of these practices that I shared with you, it will give us enough head start and save some time and give us some peace of mind knowing that, hey, you know, I am starting to come back and realize what these old forgotten projects were. With this, I hope we can take care of ourselves during these challenging times. And if and when we are finally ready to come back to our unfinished projects, we will be ready to do so. So thank you for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.